Hello, Sparkman, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where we are digging into the second day's worth of announcements from the Day to AI Summit. So, time is slowly moving on, my jet lag is receding, I'm now able to put together a coherent sentence. So, if you watched my day one keynote announcements review, there's just so much in there. It's a struggle to actually get through the giant pile of announcements. I'm glad to say day two, the pace slows a little bit. The day two keynote was a whole mix of a lot of Spark announcements, a lot of uh, Delta announcements, so mainly focusing on the open source side of things. And then lots and lots of uh, industry leaders, thought leaders, just panel discussions about the state of industry, where things are going, what they think of all the uh, things that are going on. Super, super, super interesting to watch. What makes my job a lot easier because I don't have as crazy a mountain to climb in terms of the number of announcements going on. As always, if it's your first time around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments which of these announcements you're actually really excited for, which of these things have been waiting for, or which of these things have caught you by surprise. You didn't even know this was going to happen. I mean, who writes commands in English anyway, right? So we're going to dive in. We're going to have a look at the keynote. We're going to step through various different parts of the keynote that I paused, just going to pull out some key information. And yeah, that's the general plan. So let's dig in. So... Firstly, big old shout out to Brooke, who did an awesome job as the MC throughout the whole keynote, keeping things moving. Um, now, one of the first people that we had up is Reynolds Zinn back again, talking about improvements to the Spark engine. Now, we've seen Spark 3.4 uh, come recently, and there's just loads of stuff in there. Again, it's not slowing down at all the relentless pace that new changes, new features are going into Spark. There's a whole bunch of things in there. From error message improvements, Bloom filter joins, it joins just getting better. Uh, but a column default, the unpivot function is fairly huge if you're from a SQL uh, side of the fence. Things like lateral column aliases just makes me so happy. <laughs> the fact that in a select statement, I can alias a column and then refer to it later in that same, in different clauses of that same query using that alias, it's just, it just makes life so much easier. Come on. Um, lots and lots and lots of things inside of it. Seeing streaming get better and better and better. We saw the Project Lightspeed announcements. And again, we're seeing those actually evidence going into uh, the actual Spark engine, just making uh, streaming faster, better, slicker at dealing with stateful processing, quicker at doing asynchronous checkpointing, all of that good stuff we're seeing going in. And yeah, just general enhancements on the SQL side of things, better at doing the monitoring, better at not, not relying on ganglia necessarily, <laughs> just better things all around the Spark engine. So lots of really, really nice stuff in there. Generally good pace of change. Now, one of the things I didn't really go into there is a thing called Spark Connect. So I did a video recently looking at the VS Code extension, which is powered by Databricks Connect V2, which is powered by Spark Connect. So the open source, the Apache Spark engine now has this thing called Spark Connect, which allows you to use it as a slim client API. It means you can use Spark from loads and loads and loads of different places without having to install the big gigantic Spark driver on there to go and push things off to workers. You can essentially just fire code off to your Spark drivers and use it as a little bit of an abstracted service. For Spark connectors, Spark Connect is super, super useful. So you've got Spark Connect. In Databricks, you've got Databricks Connect V2, which just adds functionality and wrappers around it. And then things like VS Code extension for Databricks are wrapped around Databricks Connect V2 again. So loads and loads of cool stuff. Again, it's already out there in the world, but we saw it go GA with the release of Spark 3.4. There's also other Python uh, improvements as generally going into the Python environment. We're just seeing improvements go in. One of which is this. So a test framework for PySpark built in to the very PySpark engine. Now that, that is great. The number of times we've had to pull code out, wrap it into some kind of Python unit test, Test it locally as Python whilst mocking PySpark, pulling out some results and trying to kind of get it working, was actually if we just have a decent test framework baked into PySpark, being able to do, as it says, assertions for columns, searching for data frames, schema validation as part of our test framework. There's loads and loads of great stuff in there. So I've not had a chance to look at it yet, but sounds great. I, I approve of this message. That is a great thing to go in especially with the rest of things with the VS Code extension, the, the developer experience is just getting more mature. If we can sit in VS Code, we can do proper code step throughs. We've got proper code linting, code quality reviews, basically code discipline baked in. Plus we can get our test coverage right up there. 
by having it built into the framework. Great. Fantastic. So really, really good improvements there. Not quite as wacky as the English SDK for Spark. So with the day one announcements, we saw this thing called Lakehouse IQ. Essentially a large language model trained upon your data that will help you do things like write code. Now, that is for in Databricks. And it's for if you're in Databricks using Unity Catalog, you can use it to do a load of stuff. The English SDK for Spark is built into the Spark engine itself and helps you write PySpark. So we did a demo. Gavi was on the show. We were talking about ChatGPT and we got it to write PySpark for us. And I grumbled because the PySpark wasn't great. Or one version was great. One version just had an old school way of formatting it. One version came out with something that was utter nonsense. This is a essentially a much slimmed down LLM that's been specially trained just on writing good Spark code. But the, end the prompts have been engineered by proper Spark nerds, which I approve of. Um, basically, just like you use Spark.sql, you can use Spark.ai, PySpark.ai, write some codes. And then that will run a data frame transformation for you. So there's actually a great demo. Do say you should watch uh, the keynote for this demo alone. We're just saying dataframe.ai.transform and then pass in a string of what your prompt is. So add a column date derived from created that. Add a column num PR created that that aggregates other numbers of created PRs that date. Just treating it like steps in your data frame DAG building. So like saying uh, data frame dot with column, this column by doing this calculation, except instead of that, we're training up transformations. So dot I transform, add this thing. Dot I transform this thing. Dot AI transform, add this thing. We don't have to write one command and then it generates code for us. This is not a code generator. This is returning a data frame that has had those changes applied to it. So we just use it as part and part of our code which is really, really, really cool, and just baked in to Spark from this release. Well, from, from the release when we actually see it get released properly. But that is so cool. Uh, really, 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 really cool. Um, and then you can use that basically wherever you're using PySpark. So just sending commands to it, you can just send some prompts with it. You could... So what, one of the things that we do uh, in terms of building out our, our rules engine is we allow our data users to, to write rules in SQL. And then we just take that SQL, shove it in, pass that into our PySpark, and just have that as a dynamic rules engine. We could just have literal rules. Business users typing, if a column says this, they should replace it with this value. And just have all these strings just held in English, just in natural language, in a giant pile of rules engine. And then we just go in a loop and say, well, dataframe.ai transform, apply that rule. That's really cool. That is really, 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 really so many uses in terms of opening up all of the data engineering stuff to so many business users, allowing people to understand what is happening, understand, get involved with the coding process. Now, I don't promise I'm going to stop writing code. I'm, I'm too much of an old nerd. I'm very happily going to be writing code. And honestly, some of those things, I could probably write the PySpark or the SQL quicker, and it would take me to write out that sentence without making spelling mistakes. Even so, for readability, for supportability, for exposing it to other people, bringing more people and saying, hey, look, the gate's open, come and join us and actually work on this platform. It's great. So much you can do there. So yeah, the English SDK for Spark's fairly kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. Pretty cool. Uh, other things, moving on to Delta. So a bunch of different things announced for Delta, one of which is liquid clustering which again, sounds so cool. Now, this is the thing where essentially we're saying partitioning, hive style partitioning, where, you know, we say data frame dot write partitioned by, and we give it some columns. And in the lake, it creates a load of folders partitioned by this, partitioned by this, partitioned by this. And then it, any files has to go into one of those subfolders. And that subfolder has to contain only files that have literally that partition value. Um, the argument coming from the Databricks leadership is that's no good. We don't want people to do that. We want people to just, just write your data down and we'll figure out the best way for it to be laid out on disk. So that's, that's the message that's been coming from that side of the fence. Um, and essentially this is, this is the culmination of that. So liquid clustering is saying, well, high style partitioning is too slow. Z ordering is too complicated and a bit too spiky in terms of how the performance actually works. 
why don't we do it a better way? So liquid clustering, so this is Michael Armburst going and explaining how that's going to work, that sometimes you've got partitions that are just bigger than others because it's skewed. Other times you've got partitions that are tiny and we're just creating lots of tiny, rubbish, small files. Liquid clustering is a lot more dynamic in terms of when we're writing data down. We When we create the table, we give it four clustering keys, as well, one to four clustering columns, and it will dynamically add files into those clusters and build it up as we're writing the data, rather than having to wait until we next do an optimize. Things, things like optimize and vacuum and things are still going to be there and still going to exist. But thinking about the performance side of it, the partitioning and the Z-ordering, less so. Really interesting. Not at all how to play. Do not know how it works. Again, really interesting with the day one announcements when they had underneath Lakehouse IQ, they've got some of the automatic file laying out. They've got some of the automatic partition improvement, the indexless indexes uh, that was happening over there. And how that sits on top of liquid clustering, I don't know. No idea how these things talk to each other yet. Uh, is it is it an evolution? So we don't have liquid clustering, and that's what enables Lakehouse IQ to be better at placing your files? Or is it something entirely different? We'll see. Lots and lots to dig into and discover on this side of the fence. There's also the announcement of the data kernel. Oh, the delta kernel, sorry. So with loads and loads and loads of different uh, implementations of delta cropping up to, to make it accessible to so many different languages, Essentially, it's getting to a point when there was like eight, nine different implementations of Delta, depending on where you were accessing it and what kind of environment you're accessing it from. They've now stripped that back, pulled it right down to having the Delta kernel, which looks after everything, and then essentially a protocol, which is then managed. Just basically, they've matured how the engine works. They've changed how it talks to other things. They've made it a little bit more accessible, a little bit better working. Uh, and yeah, it'll allow them to accelerate Delta in the future, allow them to make things go a lot faster while still abstracting any integrations from having to worry about what's going on inside. You just talk to the kernel and then that'll actually act as your abstraction layer from the internal code. Makes a lot of sense. Really, really good movement. The final thing which we also mentioned in day one is this universal format, Delta Uniform, which again, I love the portmanteau. Um, again, this is that idea that from now on, whenever you're using Delta, you'll be able to flick a switch and say, actually, could you please make Iceberg and Hoodie metadata for me as well, please? Just to make it interchangeable. So it doesn't matter if you need to send this to something using Iceberg. It doesn't matter if something using Hoodie needs to access it. You can just flick that switch and then it'll have Delta metadata, Hoodie metadata, Iceberg metadata, keep it all the same. And as long as the open source version of Delta keeps up with the readers and writers from most other sides, that is fantastic. That is going to be a real, real simplification of worrying about different storage formats and how everything works, which can all just come together in harmony. We'll see. I hope it does. I really, really hope that this actually just means we stop talking about uh, picking uh, storage formats. But yeah, really, really, really good, interesting improvements to Delta, pushing it forwards, moving it on. And that's it. That's the, the main things I wanted to go through. So probably about half the time spent them going through all of the day one announcements, real, real laser focus on, here's some really cool, interesting stuff in Spark. Mainly the English SDK is a super interesting thing to be playing with. And here's some just general improvements and maturity improvements inside of Delta to make it more robust and more scalable, to make it more interchangeable and more kind of integratable with other formats. Just great things to see, setting it up as a great position to kind of just build a load of stuff on in future. Yeah, loads and loads of good things. So, as I said, I do recommend you guys actually go and watch both keynotes. There's loads of super interesting things. Definitely the panels are really, really interesting to see where people are coming from, and the challenges people are facing, and some of the challenges people see around all of these emerging technologies. How everything's in flux and changing right now. Definitely interesting to get people's perspective on everything that's happening there. And yeah, right. I think I'm going to go and get some sleep. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll be back with more videos digging through all of these announcements over the next few weeks. We'll see you then. Cheers.